Good morning, MVPC family. Thank you so much for joining us this morning for worship. We're so glad to be with you. As we start things today, just wanted to give a quick reminder, we are going to be celebrating communion together this morning as a part of our service. So if you do not have the elements for communion ready, feel free to pause your video right now and get that set so that later when Pastor Scott leads us through communion, you will be ready. And now let's begin our time of worship this morning by singing together. Lord, in my wrestling and in my doubts, in my failures, you won't walk out. Your great love will lead me through. You are the peace in my troubled sea. Whoa, you are the peace in my troubled sea. the silence you won't let go in the questions your truth will hold your great love will lead me through you are the peace in my troubled sea Whoa, you are the peace in my troubled sea my lighthouse my You will carry me safe to shore, safe to shore, safe to shore, safe to shore. Well, I won't fear what tomorrow brings. With each morning, I rise and sing. My God's love will. You are the peace in my troubled sea. Oh, you are the peace in my troubled sea. Oh. sermon and uh, these are my grandkids they're the only kids I'm allowed to be near during shelter in place because uh, we're with these guys uh, several days every week so our quarantine includes uh, my two kids two of my kids families so I'm carrying this rock and it's really really heavy I would like to sit in this chair but I doubt that it'll hold me. How could I find out if it'll hold me? Maybe you could ask someone a little bit uh, lighter. Okay. And if it holds them and it feels like really comfortable and doesn't creak, then you could probably do it. Okay. Um, what would happen if I sat it 
Uh, then I would know. Yeah, like there's no problem okay. you it. This is really heavy. I've been carrying this rock for a long time. Yeah, you lift it. You think I can sit in it? Yeah. I doubt if it can hold me. Doesn't matter. You have to check. I'll find out. Ready? Yeah. Ready. Oh. <laughs> the chair holds me and the rock. Isn't that great? Yeah. Well, this is a parable. And the rock is all the heavy burdens that I carry. And the chair is resting in Jesus. Will he carry my weight and the weight of my burdens? And I doubt that he can. And when I put my weight on him, I find out I can rest. Well, church, we're at our text and greet time of our service again this week. We hope you've been enjoying this time. We encourage you to reach out to some different people this week via text. Pull out your phone and let's join together in reaching out to others in our church community and saying good morning and wishing them well. you've had some time. If you need to take more time after our service, please do that and respond to those texts that you get as well today. Keep that chain of love going and circulate it around as well. Well, we want to enter into a time now where we're going to be praying. And this week, we're going to have our prayer focus on some specific people from our church community. We have medical workers that are our heroes within our church community. And while you and I uh, if you're not one of these folks, uh, are able to stay at home and shelter in place. These folks are out on the front lines, working hard, fighting our fight, fighting the battles for us so that we can be safe and stay at home. I invite you as we enter into this time of prayer, there's a phrase that we're going to use as you see each of the pictures. So all the pictures that you see here, I want to invite you to pray this prayer Lord, give them grace and strength. Let's say that together. Lord, give them grace and strength. So as you see each of these pictures come up, and then after the pictures finish, I'll come back and I'll lead us through an additional time of prayer. So would you join me in prayer? Lord, while most of us stay at home and try to get along with our responsibilities from there, we recognize that there are many among us in our own community that fight on the front lines of this battle against a disease for us. So today, Lord, we lift up our medical workers and the others fighting for us. We ask you, God, to keep them safe and strong in their fight. Provide for their families while they are away. We trust them to your care. Lord, hear our prayers. Let's continue our prayer together. For those not pictured from our church community working hard to offer help to the vulnerable, Lord, give them grace and strength. For the other family and friends around the world battling this disease on the front lines to keep us all safe, give them grace and strength. For those other essential workers we encounter, store clerks, delivery people, food service workers, and so many others. Give them grace and strength. Lord, for our mission partners around the world that are suffering along with others, give them grace and strength. For the teachers struggling to provide curriculum to their students in this new environment, give them grace and strength. For the parents who've been thrust into the role of teacher on top of the rest of their responsibilities, Give them grace and strength. For our government officials at the local, county, state, and national levels, Lord, give them grace and strength. For those that are fighting cancer and other diseases at this time outside of the COVID-19, Lord, give them grace and strength. 
for those battling with other medical conditions that this pandemic has made it harder to get help and care. Lord, give them grace and strength. For those fighting depression, anxiety, and fear, Lord, give them grace and strength. For those that are lonely, scared, or isolated, Lord, give them grace and strength. For those that are struggling financially due to a loss of a job or even less income than they had before, Lord, give them grace and strength. For all of us, as we continue to wait patiently for a world to become safe to go out and resume our normal lives, whatever that may look like, Lord, give us all grace and strength. We look to you, our God, our provider, our protector, our source of strength, hope, and life itself to continue to be with us in the midst of this and to help us see and celebrate your goodness, your grace, and the strength that you provide. Amen. I am really, really delighted and impressed with your compassion toward the students. That university is among the poor people and getting money over there is so difficult, but you wiped the tear of so many from Yubangi province. And I want to express our sincere thanksgiving to you all. May God continue to richly bless you and keep you for his own glory. Thank you. Thank you. It means a lot to us that a congregation of Christians way off in distant California is not only thinking of us, but also praying for us and actually supporting us with general, generous donations, as was evident in the Easter offering that Moraga Valley Presbyterian Church sent us recently. It is the spiritual bond of fellowship that manifests itself in generous giving that keeps us going. This really is the meaning of the body of Christ which unites us all, all over the world. We know that your situation in the U.S. is also not easy. We pray for you and we thank you very much for your support. God bless you and protect you. Hi, everyone. My name is John Brule. I'm the co-chair of the Global Missions team here at Moraga Valley Presbyterian Church. And I just want to tell you how incredibly proud I am of you all. So you've heard from Tommy and Scott over the last couple of weeks talking about how great the Easter offering went. Well, we're up to like $34,000 raised. And that is actually 150% more than what we've been averaging for the last few years over Easter during this crazy time. I'm just kind of blown away. So thank you. So on behalf of the COVID-19 support that we're going to be providing here through the Deacons Fund, Near East School of Theology, UPU in Congo. I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. Well, church, I hope you feel encouraged by those thank yous that our mission partners were able to offer us. We did an amazing job with our Easter offering. I want to encourage you to continue to give strongly to our church as we continue to go through this pandemic time. We've been able to keep our staff whole at this point, and thank you for that. Thank you for your contributions to our church to allow us to stay strong during this time so that we can move forward together into the future. We'd encourage you to give online. You can find that on our webpage at mvpctoday.org, and you can see that uh, give button up at the top in the green box. Just click there and give, and you can give once, or you can set that up to give regularly as well. Would you join me in a brief word of prayer for our offering today? God, as we continue to give out of what you have entrusted us with, Lord, we want it to be a blessing, not only to you, but to those that our church is able to minister to through these funds. Would you use what we are able to offer today to bless other people? In your name we pray, amen. A reading from John 20, verses 24 to 31. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, was one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, 
unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands? Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you believe. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Jesus performed many other miracles in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, good morning again, church. Thank you so much for joining us. And Kathy, thank you so much for reading scripture. It's been such a fun part of these last couple of weeks to be able to see some of our staff members um, in their homes reading our scripture for us. So thank you, Kathy, for doing that this week. You know, I don't know about all of you, but every day when I wake up during the season, I'm confronted by the reality that there's basically only about five things that I can do on any given day. And lucky for me, one of the things that I can do and that I love to do is to read. So I have been spending a ton of time during the shelter in place reading. And I thought, inspired by all that reading time, that I would start our uh, time in the Word this morning actually with a game. So here's what I want to do. Uh, this game is going to be a quiz. And what I'm going to do is describe a plot, just briefly, of a book. And then you at home have to guess whether that book is a fiction or nonfiction book. And I want you to go on the record, if you're watching with other people, say it out loud which one you think it is. And if you were a kid at home watching, uh, or maybe even a high schooler or a college student, or even an adult, I struggled for a while to know the difference between fiction and nonfiction. So just so we're clear on that, fiction is something that is fake. That would be like a made up story, like Harry Potter is a fiction book. And a nonfiction book is something that is real. It's a biography, a story of a person who lived, it's a history, so it's about something that is real. Okay, so uh, here's our first one. And you at home have to go on record, fiction or nonfiction. This is the story of a mischievous cat who wears a hat, who visits two kids on a rainy day and helps entertain them. So at home, I'll give you a moment, fiction or nonfiction. Well, our first book was The Cat in the Hat, which is a fiction book. This is a fake one. So that was, we started off kind of easy. Uh, first one, fiction. Okay, ready for round two. Round two. This is the story of Stephen Curry's rise from a small collegiate program to NBA superstar. Fiction or nonfiction? Okay, hopefully we're all on record. This one is... Nonfiction. This is actually a book called Golden, and it is about uh, the rise of one of my favorite people that I've never met, Steph Curry. Okay, we've got two more for you. You ready for two more? Next up. This is a story of several hobbits, a wizard, a couple people, an elf, and some dwarves, as they go on a quest to destroy a magical ring that has empowered an evil sorcerer to rule the world. Fiction or nonfiction? Okay, hopefully we're all on the record. This one is, you probably know it already, I would think. This is The Lord of the Rings. Uh, this is a fiction book. It's an incredible story. It's actually um, I'm due for a reread of The Lord of the Rings coming up if this lasts long enough. And now here's our last one. Here's our last one. This is the story of a miracle worker and teacher who is executed, lies in a grave for three days, and then under his own power, rises to life, gathers his followers, and sends them out to the ends of the earth to take a message of salvation and grace. Fiction or nonfiction? Well, obviously, that's kind of a trick question, uh, but this is nonfiction. This is the series that we are in right now, Jesus Encounters. 
right? That's the story of Jesus who came from heaven to show us God's love, to teach us what it means to follow God, who's executed, lies in the grave, and then rises up to new life. And, you know, when you frame it in this way, the temptation, for me at least, is to say, well, that one's obviously fiction. It's full of miracles. Someone comes from death to life. That sounds like an impossible story. And that's why I am so excited today to dive into our topic, which is Jesus encountering the doubtful. I mean, what honestly more understandable response is there than doubt to the miraculous story that we have the opportunity to explore today. And today we're going to do that by looking at the story of Thomas. We're going to follow along as Thomas grapples with his doubts in coming to understand this incredibly uh, hard to understand event in history. So just as a recap of what Kathy read for us, prior to the passage that we're reading, the other disciples have had an encounter with the risen Jesus. They've seen him, he's showed them his wounds, and so they have come to believe that Jesus really is risen. And they come and they tell that to Thomas, and Thomas is not yet ready to take that step of belief. He's still filled with doubt, and he says, I won't believe it until I see the wounds in his hands and in his side. And a week later, Jesus comes to Thomas, and he gives Thomas the evidence that he has asked for. He shows him his wounds, and Thomas moves from doubt into belief. And we see how that transforms his life. And so today, let's explore that story together. And I want to start with Thomas's doubt. You know, uh, I don't know about you, but every time Thomas comes up, every time I hear about Thomas, I'm immediately reminded that he is the doubter. Now, that might be because he and I share a name, and I've always sort of been particularly, uh, I don't know, wanted to be able to stand up for my namesake, sensitive to that. But immediately when I hear Thomas, I think the doubter. And what I realized as I was reflecting on uh, just preparing for this sermon, what I've actually done to Thomas is I have put him in a slightly different category than the rest of the disciples. I think of the rest of the disciples as these guys who believed, right? They were filled with confidence in their belief. But somehow I have this kind of judgment in my head that Thomas is eh, a little bit deficient in some way because he's the one who doubted. He's the one who wasn't ready to believe. He kind of has this like scarlet letter, a scarlet D for doubt on him. And I realized that by applying that to Thomas, by sort of thinking that this doubt somehow makes his faith deficient or his story less than the others, what I've actually done is I've made it harder for myself to be a person who has doubts. Because if I'm going to come to Thomas with those kind of judgments, then that probably means that if I have doubts, I also have faith that is somehow insufficient. I also don't believe in the way that maybe I ought to believe because those doubts are a mark against me. But you know, as I was thinking about this sermon, something occurred to me. And so I've got one more uh, guessing game for us this morning. I, just one more. If you had to guess, in the year, we'll call it 33, which is right about when this is taking place, how many people do you think there were in the world total? Just for some context, um, right now, there are roughly 8 billion people alive. How many do you think were alive back in the year 33? Well, we obviously don't know the exact answer, but the best guesses are that there were 100, let me make sure I get this correct, 170 million people alive at that time. So just again, for some context, uh, today, a country of 170 million people would be the eighth largest country in the world. So a lot less people than exists right now, but still a lot of people. And of those 170 million people, over the course of this week, when Thomas is racked with doubt, when he is wrestling with this impossible thing that he's heard, when he's trying to decide, should I believe the testimony of my brothers, the disciples, when they tell me Jesus is alive? Should I have confidence that he actually could have risen? Or should I go with what I know is the obvious truth, dead people stay dead. As he is wrestling with that question, how many of those 170 million people do you think were also wrestling with that question? How many were racked with doubt? Well, again, you know, we don't know the exact number, but we can be pretty sure based on the witness of the gospels that it's no more than a handful. There might be a couple of guards who were there when Jesus, you know, rose, who were stunned and grappling with it. There might be a few Pharisees, but you know, there's no more than a handful of people in the whole world 
who are doubting this mysterious thing, who are wrestling with it and who are consumed by it. And what that tells me is that the reason Thomas has this doubt, the reason it probably consumed him, is not because he's not concerned with Jesus. It isn't because he's a man of little faith or no faith. It's not because he's deficient. It's because this is something intensely personal to him. Because he cares about it so much. Thomas is trapped between these two worlds. Am I in the middle of grief at having lost one of my best friends and saying goodbye to all these hopes and dreams I had for my future and the things Jesus was going to do? Or am I celebrating that something unprecedented and impossible has happened? He is stuck in these two worlds. So what this means is that his doubt is a sign that this means a lot to Thomas. You know, the world is full of things that we could be doubting. There's an almost limitless number of things that could consume us with doubt. Uh, this is a harder exercise than I thought it was going to be. I was trying to think of some examples of things that we could be doubting but are not. Uh, and these are my two best shots. I don't know how good they are, but this is what I got for us. So here's things that we could be doubting but we're most likely not. First, as it turns out, after researching for the sermon, cricket is one of the most popular sports in the world. And the number one cricket team in the world is the Indian national cricket team. I would imagine that there are countless people in the world right now consumed with doubt about whether or not India is going to be able to maintain its place as the number one cricket team in the world. I would also be willing to guess that those people consumed with that doubt are not amongst our congregation here at MVPC. Although if you are, I would love to hear that. I would be fascinated to talk about that. So that's my first example of something we are not doubting. Here's my second one, last one. Uh, six years ago, the Japanese space program launched a probe called the Hayabusa 2 that went to an asteroid, collected some samples, and is now on its way back to Earth, and it's going to land at the end of 2020. And I would imagine in the space community, and particularly in the Japanese space community, people are racked with doubt about whether or not this mission is going to be successful after six years, and who knows how much time went into preparing for it. I would imagine that the congregation of MVPC is not particularly consumed with doubt about the success of the Hayabusa 2 mission, although it sounds pretty amazing, so we might actually be now. Um, I've gotten, I'm on board now to know what happens. But I think the reason that we don't doubt those things and the reason we don't doubt all the things we don't doubt is because they're not personal to us or a part of our story. But you know the things that I do have doubt about? I have doubt about this pandemic and how long it's going to last, and how it's going to change my life and my work and my family, I have a lot of doubt about that. I have doubt about myself and how I handle myself in different relationships in my life, and if I'm living the way that I'm supposed to and treating people as well as I could, I have a lot of doubt about me. I have a lot of doubt, uh, in all honesty, about whether or not the Warriors are going to be able to build another championship team around their core of Steph, Clay, and Draymond. I spend a lot of time thinking about that. And if I'm honest, I have a lot of doubt still about my faith. I have questions that I do not have answers to, things that I want to understand, uh, things that I need to reconcile. I still have doubt about those things. And the first learning that I would want to have for us today, and my encouragement from this text, is that we should not take doubts as a sign that we need to be ashamed. But instead, we should realize that doubt is a sign that something matters to you. Doubt in your life points to significance in the thing that you are doubting because you have merited that thing as being worth your time, attention, and worry. So let's enter into this today, not feeling ashamed of our doubts, not feeling like we need to hide them, but able to bring those to the surface because they actually speak value to the things that we're doubting. Well, that might tell us that we don't need to hide from our doubts, but it doesn't tell us what to do with our doubts. So what should we do with our doubts? And here again, I think we want to look to Thomas because he sets a great example for us. Thomas, faced with his doubt, Again, sort of trapped between these two seemingly impossible and contradictory truths. One, he knows something that we all know, something that we learn um, just through the course of life, is that once someone has died, in this life, they stay dead, right? You can take that to the bank. 
Megan and I live over in Oakland, and we live about a mile away um, from this beautiful cemetery in Oakland. It's on the Oakland Hills, and they often open it up so you can go walk through it. And so we will routinely go walk our dog through that cemetery. And just so happens that's the cemetery where my great-grandparents and my grandparents are buried. And we will routinely walk past where their graves are. And it's kind of a, a wonderful way to be able to remember them and think about them. But you know, I take that walk, unfortunately it's closed now so I can't go through, but when I take that walk, I do it with the full confidence that those graves are always going to be filled with the remains of my grandparents because I know that in this life, once you've passed on, you stay dead. So Thomas has this firm reality that he's standing on. But he also has this impossible question because Jesus, who he has seen do incredible and amazing things, is now said to be alive. So he's got this question. He doesn't know how to make sense of it. I know that this is how things work. I'm realizing this new challenge. I can't reconcile them, so I am stuck in the middle. And what Thomas does, I think, is so smart and inspirational to us. It should guide us. He explores his doubt. He asks for evidence. He wants more information. And what Thomas asks for is just the same evidence that the other disciples got. He says, look, you guys got to see Jesus. You got to see the wounds. I want that. I want to be able to see the same evidence that you got. And this, I think, is such a smart move. And Jesus seems to be totally fine with this request from Thomas because just a week later, he grants it. He shows up and he says, Thomas, here's what you said you've needed. And here's the evidence that you've required. You can put your hands in my wounds. You can see that I am both alive, but I am the one who is dead. And it's this that allows Thomas to move from his doubt into belief. And this is what I would want to encourage us to do as well, to be people who explore our doubt. In fact, I think this is our second learning for today. When you have doubt, don't silence it. Explore it. Now, it is made clear to us in this chapter. Uh, Jesus says this, and John, the author of this gospel, tells us this as well that we do not have available to us the same evidence that the apostles and Thomas asked for. At least uh, encounters with the risen Jesus are not the normative way that we get to encounter Jesus now that he has ascended. That was kind of a special gift that he gave in that interim time. But what Jesus says and what John says is that we do have the evidence we need. In fact, John says he wrote this gospel so that we would have the evidence that we need, us believers today, that we would need in order to believe. And so we, with this instruction to explore our doubt, have resources available. We have got the gift of God's word. We have other believers that we can ask about their experiences. We have the gift of the church where we can hopefully bring our doubts. And our hope is that this church would be a place where you can bring your doubts, where you can bring your questions, where you can bring the things that you are stuck between, and we can help you uh, walk that journey forward. So we have resources available. And in fact, we also have evidence now of 2,000 years of people placing their faith and trust in Jesus that sufficient evidence to explore has been given, even if we don't get to encounter Jesus face-to-face -face, uh, as kind of... Um, you know, the same way that the disciples did. So my encouragement to you is if you have doubts, if you have questions, don't hide them, don't run from them, explore them. And please use us as a resource in that. But, and I want to hold these two things in tension. While we want to explore our doubts, I think we also want to be careful not to make doubts our destination. And in fact, here's sort of my third encouragement, my third learning for us today which is that we should let doubt be a part of our journey, but not our destination. You know, uh, working with our high school students, one of my favorite things that I get to do is talk about their doubts, talk about their questions. It'll be pretty normal on a Wednesday uh, after senior high is wrapping up for a student to come and say, hey, Tommy, can we talk about something? And I love getting to wrestle through those questions, whether it's something that they're learning at school about history or science, or whether it's some encounter or newer information they've had. They're trying to make sense of their faith, and they're wrestling through this doubt. And it's so cool to get to journey with students uh, through that. But as a pastor in those conversations with students and adults, one of the things that I've noticed, and you may know people like this, is there are certain people who seem to make doubt their home. 
They kind of settle into what feels like a safe place. And they go from seeking to explore so that they might someday follow Jesus to just perpetually exploring. They just kind of stay in those questions. And I'll have people who day after day or week after week or year after year will come and just sort of be stuck in that same cycle of exploration. And the problem when you turn it out into a home as a part, uh, as when you turn it into a destination as opposed to just sort of part of your journey is that you miss out on the benefits of that step of belief. Because belief is a place that Jesus invites us to be. In fact, in, in Jesus' interaction with Thomas, he says, Thomas, do not disbelieve, but believe. And Thomas, after grappling with these questions, after wrestling with them, actually does make his peace. He does come from a place of doubt into a place of belief. And we see this has unbelievable benefits for him. The, the biggest one is that he has now expanded his understanding of who Jesus is. He has a new, rich, and full understanding of who it is that stands in front of him. In fact, Thomas is the first person in the book of John to confess that Jesus is God. Right? The book of John has told us this. It opens with this, telling us that Jesus is God himself come down from heaven. But no person within the story has realized that in its fullness prior to Thomas. But Thomas, by journeying through his doubt, by wrestling with that, now understands that the one who stands before him is both his Lord and his God. And what Thomas realizes is that by belief, he has been given the gift of what Jesus had done on the cross for him. He has stepped into life. And Thomas's whole life is transformed by that. In fact, what we see, um, not in Scripture, but what is really well documented, is that Thomas is so convinced of who Jesus is. He is so bought into being a part of his family, so moved by the salvation that he's experienced, that he allows Jesus to direct the whole rest of his life. He follows him wherever he leads. And Thomas, in fact, follows God's calling all the way to India, where he spends the last 20 years of his life preaching the gospel to people who had never heard it. And what I want to invite, what I want to invite us into today, what I want us to experience are the benefits of belief. Let's hear how John says this, because John says this at the end um, of John chapter 20. I think this is beautiful. He says that these things are written that you may believe that Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. And so this is my final hope for us this morning. I think this is the the final thing that the word says to us. Believe in Jesus as your Lord and God. And by believing, have life in his name. Know the gift of his eternal life. What it means to have your sins washed away, forgiven because of what Jesus did on the cross for you, to be made a part of his family forever. No life following the call of Jesus as he leads you to be a part of his mission in the world right now, bringing healing and restoration and wholeness by inviting others to know the life that Jesus offers. Journey through your doubts, explore them, give them voice, but be confident to stand on that belief so that you may experience life with Jesus. So I know that we've covered a lot this morning, so let's just uh, recap and then I would love to pray for us. As we journey through doubt, here are the four things I think we want to know. First, doubt is not something to be ashamed of because doubt is a sign that something matters to you. Second, don't silence your doubt. Explore it. Use the available tools to dig in on those tough questions. Third, let doubt be a part of your journey, but not your destination. Don't make doubt your home. Because... Here's four. When you believe in Jesus as your Lord and God, by believing, you will have life in his name. Let me pray for us to that end. Jesus, thank you so much for who you are. Thank you for the ways that you have stepped into our story and you have drawn our attention to you so that we might consider you, Lord, so that we could be racked with doubt, about the amazing God that you are, but all of the mystery that you bring. 
Lord, I ask that you would give us the tools and the courage to explore that doubt, that you would help us to have the right resources around us, and that you would meet us in that journey, that we could hear your voice, both through the power of your spirit and through the power of your word. And ultimately, Lord, I ask that you would help us to be people who believe. Believe that you are our Lord and our God. And that you would help us to experience the life that you have to offer, Lord. Your salvation and also the work of your kingdom. We love you so much and we are so grateful for who you are. Amen. Thank you, Tommy, for that great exploration of doubt on the journey toward faith. And you're right, we do doubt things about God because we care so deeply about getting it right and knowing him really. And not to be ashamed of doubt at all, but to walk into it and let it be a part of our journey of growing toward greater understanding and maturity and trust in God. And the challenge not to let it get stuck, make that our home, our destination, that we are doubters and not moving on to fully resting, believing, trusting in Jesus Christ. But doubt has its downsides, and that may be it's a a good invitation for us to face ourselves as we really are, because we can come to this communion table as we honestly are. Would you pray with me? And God, in our freedom to be honest, we acknowledge that for some times and some of us, Doubt has moved from a stage on a journey to a destination, and we've rested in doubt such that we felt free to not do what you have invited us to do, what you've told us to do, and we've moved you out of the center of our affection and our allegiance and our obedience. We've gone our own way, and we've done things we shouldn't have done, and we've left undone things that we should have done. And that's what you call sin, missing the mark. And we acknowledge it. And we come to your unconditional love, just as we are, because we know of your infinite love in Jesus Christ, which we receive and we rest in. In Jesus' name we come. Amen. You know, friends, I I love the fact that On the first night when Jesus instituted this Lord's Supper, at the table was Thomas, the doubter, Peter, who later that night was going to betray him, but deny him, and then uh, Judas, who later that night was going to betray him. And still he offers to them these representations of his body and his blood and says, I love you with a divine love anyway. That's good news for you and me. And so, like Jesus that first night who said, this is my body, which is given for you, so I say to you, this represents and is Christ's body given for you to take it and eat it. And after dinner, he took the cup, and he says, this cup is a new way of relating to God, a new covenant that's accomplished in my blood by what I have done, laying down my life, not because of what you've done or what you even understand or know. And so he invited them and invites us to receive it. Not an assent to something you believe, but something you taste. And so, after he'd given thanks, he said to his disciples, take and eat. This is my body given for you, and I invite you at home or in your office or car or wherever you are to take what you've prepared as uh, the bread and eat it in remembrance of God's love for you in Jesus Christ. Mm -mm. Taste God's love for you. Mm. Mm. And then he took the cup. And he says, This cup represents my lifeblood 
which I gladly shed for you. Receive my life into you. And by the way, beloved, that's why the church is now the body of Christ. We are enfleshing his love as he's enfleshed it to us. Drink you all of it. Pass the cup around or however you're doing it in your setting. God loves you a lot. Let's pray. Thank you that you have taken these very common elements, bread and the fruit of the vine, and turned them into means of you in fleshing your grace to us. And we've tasted it. Not that we fully understand, but we rest in you and trust in your love and know that's who we are, the beloved. And now would you let this grace do its work in us so that we do actually bear Christ into the world, into all of our relationships and all of our days and hours. In Jesus Christ we pray expectantly. Amen. And now I invite you to join in singing a, a song about Jesus Christ being our cornerstone. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus, blood, and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but holy trust in Jesus' name. Let's sing together. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name.
in him be found dressed in his righteousness alone faultless stand before the throne I want to give you an update on our transition as you know I am here through mid-june two weeks ago the session uh, elected a search committee for the next transitional pastor, and uh, in our polity, the session elects and calls a transitional pastor. You, the congregation, will create a search committee of the congregation, and you will elect the permanent pastor. That committee that the session has authorized has already begun uh, identifying and has interviewed several candidates already. They hope to have the search completed by mid-May, and ratified by session such that the new pastor can take over in mid-June. Well, thank you to the many of you that have already completed our survey and helped us with giving us your input on kind of what you believe about our church and where you want our church to go. Today, if you're watching this on a Sunday, is the last day to complete that survey. So if you haven't completed it yet, please take some time, even right after finishing this service, to go to the, our website, mvpctoday.org, and you can click on the link there to take the survey. Especially if you're any younger than me, and I'm 50 this year, so if you're younger than me, we really need your input on this about the future of our church. Well, church, next week is Mother's Day, and we really want to be able to celebrate our moms together. And one of the ways we want to do that is by sharing pictures of what it looks like to be a mom in this time. So please send in your pictures of mom, uh, whether it's them going to their essential service jobs, learning how to do school at home and teaching, whether it's working from home, whatever it looks like to be mom right now, send us some pictures because we want to celebrate that together. And now let me send us out with this word of blessing. May we be people who believe in Jesus as our Lord and God. And by believing, may we know life in his name.